All right. So uh, let's just recall that where we paused was our understanding of what is possible when it comes to designing mechanisms with certain properties. Um, and the, the last thing that we saw was that it is not possible to come up with a mechanism which is simultaneously onto strategy proof and non-dictatorial. That is where we stopped, right? We didn't actually prove this, but we just built, uh, built our way into understanding that strategy proofness implies monotonicity. Strategy proofness and onto implies unanimity. And based on monotonicity and unanimity, we sort of got some intuition based on examples for why what we are saying might be true. But as I said, I'm deferring an actual proof to later. Uh, by later, I mean hopefully during one of the tutorial sessions, we'll have a chance to revisit it. But I want to continue the story by talking about what can we do to work around these, uh, you know, uh, impossibility results that make it seem like coming up with good voting rules is uh, not something that we can hope for. So informally, these rules are saying that you can't make everyone happy all the time, which is intuitive, but at the same time, not something that we want to live with. And I also mentioned that uh, if you think about the last impossibility result that we saw, two things that we could try and do are A, randomization and B, trying to see if we can quantify the extent to which we are giving up on strategy proofness. And we also briefly mentioned that both of these approaches, uh, in, uh, there's a formal sense in which both of these approaches in fact also fail. Uh, so now I'm finally going to present some positive news. I'm going to talk about approaches that do work. And the first one is uh, this really nice uh, notion of restricted domains. The idea is that we, uh, we would like to see if there is a sensible subset of profiles that we can carve out and focus our attention on in the hope that maybe these are some well-behaved profiles on which we can hope to design mechanisms that do better. And it turns out that this has become a fairly fruitful uh, a way of looking at things and has led to uh, some uh, interesting lines of research. And I'll focus on one such set of approaches. And there are several others. I mean, there are many ways in which you can carve out pieces of this big pie, which is the set of all profiles. I'm going to focus on a specific way of doing it, which is called uh, the notion of single peaked profiles. If we have time, we'll also take a peek at what it means to talk about single crossing uh, uh, preferences. So, so I'm going to start by trying to present the definition of what it means for a profile to be single peaked. Okay, so let's motivate this by considering maybe a typical uh, political situation where you have candidates whom we line up based on their philosophies. Uh, so that's why we have left, center and right. Uh, and so A and G are the extreme candidates. Uh, A is extreme left and G is extreme right. Okay. And you can imagine that a particular voter's preferences over these candidates would typically not be completely arbitrary. When we were looking at the space of all possible profiles, we were really considering all kinds of weird combinations of votes. But let's say that this is a you know, specific situation that we are in. Uh, can you imagine a voter that ranks A as her top candidate and G as her second favorite candidate? Is that, I mean, is that realistic? I mean, it's a soft question. I mean, of course, formally a permutation is any ordering of the candidates and this would be admissible. But if you just think about it, um, a voter that places A on the top is presumably a left-leaning voter if, if she likes an extreme left candidate as her favorite candidate then it is very unlikely that she will pick an extreme right candidate for her second spot, right? It's probably going to be a softer transition 
uh, where maybe it goes like A, B, C, D in that sort of a sequence, right? Um, imagine a voter whose favorite candidate is D, which is uh, a candidate who is in the center. And then again, to think that D would be immediately followed by A or G seems unreasonable, right? Because if, you are, if your favorite candidate is somebody who is in the center, then you are probably not somebody who is extreme. And you would probably not immediately have a preference for the extremist candidates just after you have indicated that the candidate in the center is your top preference. Right? So some combinations seem to be unreasonable. Like I said, A followed by G or D followed by A. These combinations seem a little unrealistic. So let's try to uh, propose a definition that accounts for this intuition and says that, well, we are just going to rule out permutations which don't seem to follow uh, the natural instinct that we are being presented with here. Okay? So, okay, I need to get used to this, but all right. So, uh, here, I don't know if it's visible, but yeah, I'm focusing on the candidate E. Here is a voter who likes E the best. And here is what I'm suggesting would be a reasonable ordering of the remaining candidates. So, for instance, let's, okay, sorry. So, So let's just focus on the candidates who are to the left of E, right? So that's A, B, C, and D. And notice that the way they are ranked here, their relative ordering is D, C, B, A, which is to say that the further a candidate is from A on the left to right spectrum, the lesser the voter seems to like it. And that seems reasonable considering that E is the voter's favorite candidate, right? And if that's where your heart really is, the further a candidate is away from this guy, the less you are likely to be in favor of such a candidate. And the same goes for candidates in the other direction, okay? So it seems reasonable to say that any candidate, any voter that likes E the best will prefer D less than E, C less than D, B less than C, and A less than B. And similarly, will prefer F less than E and G less than F. However, these that still leaves you a, a fair amount of room to construct multiple preferences that respect the criteria that I just suggested. So, for example, here is one where I have merged the two sort of, so so I guess what I said was that E is preferred over D, is preferred over C, is preferred over B, is preferred over A. And we also think it's reasonable that E is preferred over F, is preferred over G. But these two orderings can still be merged in multiple ways. You can imagine interleaving uh, this portion of the order with this portion of the order in multiple ways. and. I, we perhaps have no reason for ruling out any of these interleavings. Any of these interleavings would still be reasonable. So all of those interleavings are in some sense permissible in the framework that we are going to be proposing here. Okay. So I, I probably have a couple of more examples of orders that respect uh, this idea. So. Here is a different interleaving and you could do a few others and you can also easily come up with examples that violate the criteria that I am suggesting here. So this is a typical pictorial representation of what it means for a preference or a permutation to be single peaked with respect to a universal ordering over the candidates. So this ordering over the candidates which is A through G going from left to right this is something that is fixed a priori. Some people call it the harmonious ordering. Uh, some people call it the universal ordering. So this is some fixed permutation of the candidates. And we say that another permutation, which is presumably the preference of a voter, is single peaked with respect to the harmonious order if it has the property that 
if you look at the position of the top candidate in the permutation and then look at the positions of the remaining candidates, then the way they are ordered in the permutation respects the harmonious ordering in the way that we just discussed. Okay, so we will make this a little more formal, but hopefully the idea is beginning to emerge or you know uh, is becoming clear. So, so here is a slightly more precise definition. Uh, we say that you have a preference that is single peaked if when you say that x is liked better than y, okay, then either x is your favorite candidate and if x is your favorite candidate you are allowed to like x more than any of the other candidates. But if this is not the case then if x and y lie on the same side of the peak which so I am using the word peak to refer to the favorite candidate of the voter. So if x and y both lie on the same side of the peak then y must appear later than x in the harmonious order. y must be further away from x, further away from the peak than x is, okay. Uh, of course, if x and y are on opposite sides of the peak, then we are not really bothered because that is the interleaving that we were referring to. If these two candidates are on either side of the peak, then x can be ranked above y, there is no problem, right. So whenever we rank, so Okay, so, so let's, so what is the test for a permutation being single peaked with respect to a harmonious order? So, uh, so again, let's say that A to G is the fixed harmonious ordering and let's say that you give me a permutation. My test is going to be that for every pair of candidates, I'm going to check if, so let's say you have ranked B above D and let's say E is your favorite candidate, right? Then does that pass the test for single peakness or does that fail the test for single peakness? B over D. You say you like B more than D. Okay, how many of you think that B over D would not be a valid single peaked order assuming that E is the peak? Okay, so yeah, so it turns out that D is closer to the peak than B is. Right? So, you would, you would want to rank D higher than B, but it could be that the gap between B and D could be, I mean, uh, you know, you can't really control that. You might be ranking F and G in between or you, it, I mean, the gap will be at least two because you still have to rank C before you can bring in B into the picture, but it could be more than that. But nonetheless, D has to be ranked higher than B if you have an ordering that is single peaked with respect to this order with E being the top candidate, yeah. So, um, so essentially for any pair of candidates which are on either side of the peak, there is nothing to check. But if you are two candidates who are on the same side of the peak, then your relative order must be something that respects the harmonious order, which is to say that uh, if you rank A higher than B, then A must be closer to the peak than B is. Is that clear? That's the, that's the definition of what it means for a given permutation to be single peaked with respect to a fixed harmonious order or a fixed universal permutation. So the situation we are going to consider is what if your profile only consists of preferences which are single peaked, meaning there exists a universal ordering on the set of candidates with respect to which every vote is a single peaked order. Okay, so remember they can all have, they can all peak at different places, so they, they, uh, the voters can have different favorite candidates, but once you fix your favorite candidate, you must have this sort of a, uh, you know, uh, uh, diminishing on either side of the harmonious order with still some flexibility in how you interleave. That's, that's the kind of profile that we will concern ourselves with. So you could ask yourselves how many single peaked orderings are there with respect to a fixed harmonious order and you should convince yourself that you can come up with very many of them. I'm not going to um, 
suggest how many, but just think about what the possibilities are. Essentially, if you peak somewhere in the middle, then you have these two fixed orderings, but you have various ways in which you can interleave them. So think about how you would enumerate those choices. So that's an interesting question to think about. How many single peaked orderings are there? I mean, it would be a little silly if our definition was so restrictive that there are only a very small number of orderings which respect the definition, then you wouldn't really be looking at an interesting class of profiles. So convince yourself that there are many <laughs> single peaked uh, orderings. As I said, I, uh, I'm not going to put a number on it, just think about it. Uh, the other reason why this is a reasonable set of preferences to look at is that there is a lot of literature justifying that these preferences are a reasonably realistic model of uh, let's say real world election instances for in, for example, I mean the motivation is right here um, and there is um, uh, there is some data to support this claim. In fact, I think the definition was also inspired by studies in political science which uh, observed this sort of behavior. So uh, let's just settle with the idea that this is a reasonable notion to propose. Uh, there are also other reasons why it's exciting to look at single peak preferences. So as I said, I've already mentioned the last point here. But okay, one thing to worry about is given a profile, you also, a fundamental question is to check if it is single peak because uh, without knowing if your profile has this property or not, it would be a little hard to make progress on anything else. Let's say you have a mechanism which works well for single peaked profiles. Before you apply the mechanism, you want to be sure that your profile is in fact single peaked. So it's a nice puzzle to think about how will you check if a collection of permutations is single peaked or not, right? Does that question make sense? I give you a bunch of rankings. And I want to know, can you come up with this universal ordering of the candidates with respect to which each one of these rankings is single peaked? Yeah, so that's, I'm kind of turning the tables now. Previously, I, for the uh, definition, we were saying that if there is a ranking which is universal with respect to which every other, every other given ranking has this nice property, then we say that uh, the collection of rankings that we have is single peaked and now I'm saying okay so typically you are given a profile to contend with to work with how do you check if you can how do you check if it is single peaked how do you check if there exists a universal ranking with respect to which all of these rankings have these nice properties so that is that is one thing to worry about but it turns out that this is something that you can actually efficiently check And again, it's not something that we will be getting into, at least not right away. The thing that I really want to focus on is that there is a mechanism with respect to which uh, no agent or no voter has an incentive to change their preferences. Okay. So uh, that is, uh, that, that, that makes this a legitimate follow-up to the discussion we had earlier in the morning. So essentially I'm saying that if your preferences are single peaked, then there is a mechanism which is strategy proof on such profiles. Okay. All right, um, I'm also claiming that there are no Condorcet cycles, uh, which are these majority cycles that, that we saw previously, right? So you remember we said that if you look at the majority outcome, so for instance, we said that you could have situations where uh, you prefer A over B, uh, okay, so I, I don't remember how I told you the arrows yesterday, but uh, yeah, maybe this is what I did say that, that A is preferred over B, B is preferred over C and uh, C is preferred over A. So that, that would be a majority cycle situation. Um, so if you're going to get bored for the rest of this lecture, maybe this is something you can wrestle with and convince yourself that there are no Condorcet cycles emerging from single peaked preferences. And remind me if we have a bit of time at the end, we will revisit this. But for now, I want to get to the issue of uh, whether agents 
whether we can come up with a strategy proof mechanism because that's the uh, that's the thing that arguably interests us the most at this point okay so so I'm going to start by describing or proposing a mechanism and then we will think about whether it's strategy proof or not yeah so what is this picture? So we have here all the candidates and I have enlisted below each candidate the voters who rank this candidate at their top positions. Okay, so A has three voters for whom the peak was at A, right? There are uh, three voters who peak at D, for instance, and so on and so forth. So this is the entire collection of voters partitioned according to uh, which candidate they place at the top spot, okay? All right. Okay. Yes. The mechanism uh, outputs the so-called median candidate, which in this example, um, I think we find it at D. So what is the median candidate? You basically walk across, walk down the harmonious order, okay, and keeping track of the cumulative count of votes that you have received thus far, okay. So essentially think of this as, um, yeah, so essentially it's the candidate where the total number of votes that you have collected up to that point crosses uh, you know, half the entire population. That's that's the median candidate. So do I draw a normal curve based on, okay, you're thinking of this as, as, so if you interpreted this as a histogram, there is no reason to believe that the histogram would have like a normalish shape, if that's what you're asking. Because even in this example, if you were to draw a histogram on the, candidates so you see that there are three here there's just one here oh on the single so I'm actually in fact hiding the rest of the the rest of the vote I'm just so the so each of these voters have a single peak uh, preference so but for instance this voter here uh, peaks at D, uh, all of these voters peak at D, but they could have fairly different preferences, right? In the sense that this could be D followed by C followed by B followed by A and then E, F, G. Whereas this could be potentially, let's say D, C, E, B, F, A, G. These are both these are both valid single peaked orders. Um, and uh, so, so maybe I did have this picture here, which probably reminds you of a normal curve. Uh, this was just to indicate the direction in which the preferences flow from the peak, just outwards. But that's, that's all that it is depicting. So there isn't a, uh, there isn't a more serious uh, significance for this picture. It's just indicating that, you know, the preferences go downhill from the peak in either direction, but you still have plenty of room for doing the interleaving, yeah? Does that answer your question? Yeah, okay. Yeah, as I said, if you look at the data here, it isn't necessarily, uh, yeah, I mean, this, uh, these bars could have any structure, I think. Yeah, so it's pretty arbitrary even here. So these bars are just collecting the top vote statistics, the top candidate statistics from the voters, right? So that's, that's all that we are staring at. 
Sorry, was there a question? Right, right. So for these voters, there isn't much, uh, there isn't much of an option. If your favorite candidate is A, then the rest of your ordering is fully determined. There isn't any room for maneuvering. Similarly, if your favorite candidate is G, there is no room for maneuvering. That, that's a good point. Thanks. Okay, so uh, coming back to the mechanism, um, as I said, we enlist um, we enlist the voters who vote for these candidates at the top, and we find the find the candidate who has amassed half the votes cumulatively, right? And that's the candidate that we output as the winner. So this is a social choice function. So I mean, of course, you could turn it into a ranking by eliminating this candidate from consideration, running the rule again, and then finding the next best candidate and so on. Uh, but for now, let's just focus on um, the social choice version of the, of the mechanism. Right? Okay, so The first claim here, which I think we, we should be able to prove, is that this candidate D beats every other candidate in pairwise elections. So does anyone want to take a stab at this? Sorry? All candidates, uh, sorry, all voters, you mean? No. Yeah, all voters have their peak. All voters in this column have their peak at D. All voters here have their peak at C on the second column. I mean, on the third column, sorry. Yeah, so, uh, so these are the guys. So, whose favorite candidate is C, right? And I mean, so that's how the columns are defined. So maybe let's just see what happens if we um, if we ask D to battle it out with B, maybe, right? So really, we are looking at. Uh, we are looking at a pairwise contest between B and D at this point. So, who are the voters who prefer D over B and who are the voters who prefer B over D? Maybe this is not the best choice, maybe so because B and D sound so similar. Yeah, C, yeah, hopefully I can make that sound distinct. So, so let's do C versus B. So notice that every voter, every voter who speak is at D or to the right of D. They are all voters who are going to vote for, so all of these guys here are going to vote for D over C because their peak is to the right of D. Right, so um, so C is further away from the peak, and the voters who are going to vote the other way are here. Right, so for them D is further away from the peak, so this is going to be C over D. And because of the choice of D being the median candidate, right, uh, because you're going to include these votes, right? So this is essentially you stop the first time that you cross half, right? So even if you look at it from the other side, uh, this side is always going to be heavier or uh, at, it's, it's going to actually be heavier than the other side. Yeah. So this is including the votes for D and the rest of the votes, right? 
So if this was less than half the votes, if the if this set was less than half, then well, I mean, then this chap here is already more than half and D would not have been the median. The median would have shifted to the left, right? So if this collection here, if this is less than half the votes, then this is more than half the votes, then why did you go all the way up to D to identify the median point, right? You would have stopped short even earlier, right? So this is certainly more than half the votes here which implies that D in fact does beat C in a pairwise election. And a very similar argument holds for any candidate to the left of D. And a symmetric argument holds for all the candidates who are to the right of D. If you are to the right of D, then again people who are going to, so let's just quickly do this with maybe D versus F for instance. So the candidates who are going to vote for F over D are, sorry, the voters who are going to vote for F in favor of D are the voters in the last two columns, right? The, here you have that F is a favorite and at G again, D is further from G than F is. But everyone else is going to prefer, so if the peak is, um, so these are the guys who are going to vote for F over D, but all of these folks here, so certainly all of these guys here and even if, okay, so I don't want to account for E, I think that would not be quite accurate because when, when you peak here, D and F are on either side and the interleaving could go either way, I don't really control that. So, so any, any candidates strictly between D and F, I, I'm not going to comment about them. But at least all the way up to D's column, all of these folks definitely have a peak either at D or to the left of D, which makes F further away from D from their point of view. So all of these guys are going to prefer D over F. Yeah, And then this is again by the same logic of picking the median point, this is strictly more than half the week. This, does this explain why there are no Condorcet cycles? If you have a clear Condorcet winner, then you cannot have a majority cycle, right? All right, so that's be somewhat sorted. So I think this. Okay, the slides pretty much repeated the arguments that we made, so I skipped ahead. Uh, here is the real, uh, the real deal that we were waiting for, which is to say that this is a strategy proof mechanism. So does anybody here have an incentive to deviate from their truthful choice? So first of all, notice that this mechanism has a flavor of plurality in the sense that it seems to be only accounting for who is at the top, it's making use only of that information, okay? But it does it in a slightly more sophisticated way because it also has this harmonious ordering uh, in addition. So, so it's, uh, it's combining information from the top positions along with the harmonious ordering to do something interesting. So really if you make any changes in your interleaving for instance, if you don't change your peak, if you only change the way in which you interleave the orderings, will that affect the output of the mechanism? Okay, so these voters here certainly have no incentive to deviate because they are getting their favorite candidate, right? Their top candidate was D and that's what the mechanism is giving us. Let's look at a voter here may be tempted to deviate. What I'm asking is can she deviate by keeping C at the top and then changing the way in which she interleaves the orders on either side of C. Will that make a difference to the outcome of the mechanism? Yes. 
Okay, uh, that's that's a good question. When we talk about manipulation, um, can we can we deviate to a different ordering, which is uh, not single peak? In this case, let's just constrain ourselves to manipulating within the space of single peak profiles. You could also consider what happens when you are allowed to do more. Um, and I think things may be slightly different in such a scenario. But here our point is that our preferences naturally follow a single peak order. And one issue with deviating from such would be that you also run the risk of getting caught, right? I mean, a manipulator would also not want to raise suspicion. So one of the justifications for saying that the manipulated vote should also be single peaked is that uh, you stay under the radar that way. If you go out of the norm, then that, that may just raise suspicion. So let's just work with the assumption that we are moving uh, to a single peaked order. Yeah. Because even in the computational perspective, I mean, both versions are studied, but I think the more common assumption is that when you are working within a domain, your manipulative attempts also remain within the domain. It's uh, a fairly standard assumption. So the first question is changing. Um, I mean, if a voter in C's column continues to keep C at the peak and messes around with the rest of her preferences. I mean, in fact, for the statement that I'm making, it probably doesn't even matter as to whether the preferences, I mean, the ordering ends up even violating single peakness because Consider what the mechanism is doing. It's enlisting voters who have voted for C at the top position, and it's using this it's using this picture to make its decision, right? Will this picture change if your manipulations are such that they only happen beyond your top preference? So if nobody changes their top preference and they, you know, even if they collude and they sit down and, you know, uh, try to do something interesting with the rest of their with the with the rest of their rankings will that affect the outcome of the mechanism okay some of you seem to think that it will not affect the output of the mechanism and why is that So my question is, if nobody, if no voter changes uh, the candidate that they place at the top position, then will the output of the mechanism change? So you go to another profile from this one, let's say, where the votes may be quite different, but everyone still retains the candidate that they have placed at their top position then will the output of the mechanism change? The mechanism in question here is the median candidate mechanism. This is the, the algorithm that we just proposed to output a winner was that we'll make this little histogram here and we will output the median candidate. Won't change. Because the picture of the histogram stays the same, right? No matter what you do, if the top positions remain the same, then the way you're going to collect the voters also stays the same and nothing about the mechanism is affected. So if you want to have a serious shot at manipulation, then you have to change your peak, right? Otherwise, you will not be able to affect or influence the outcome of the mechanism. Okay, so suppose our friend here, the first voter in C's column, suppose uh, she wants to attempt manipulating by changing her peak. What should she change her peak to? Where can she go? Does it make a difference if she changes the peak from C to B or C to A? Because that would just move this circle here or here. 
but the overall location of the median stays the same. Right? It's the same story if she goes to D. Right? What else can she do? She could potentially change her peak to something beyond D like E, F or G. So she could go and join one of these columns. How will that affect the location of the medium, median? Will it move the median to the left or to the right? Right. Yeah, so if she, she moves to the other side of the fence, then the median either stays the same or in fact moves to the right. right? Because you are making this side lighter. So it will take you longer to find the median, if at all, right? So, so the median candidate, well, either stays the same, in which case you achieve nothing, or if you did manage to change it, it actually moves rightwards. But since you peaked to the left of the median, if the median moves towards the right, the outcome is better for you or worse for you? Remember that your true preferences are at least single peak, right? Even if your deviation is not. So if your true preference is single peak, would you be happy if the median moved towards the right, considering that your peak was to the left of the median? No, right? Because that's only going to be further off from what you want. So if you move your peak to the right of the median, then you run the risk of worsening the outcome. And if you move your peak to the left of the median, then you don't change the outcome. So either way, you are pretty helpless. I mean, you cannot, you either, you either don't change the outcome or you make it worse, which means that you actually do not have any incentive to deviate. And I think in this argument, you probably could even try deviating to a non-single peak preference, but the same argument would work in the sense that what the mechanism is doing is anyway taking the top positions, right? And um, what we said about the mechanism being a Condorcet winner may get affected if, I mean, that really depends on every, every vote being single peak. But in this manipulation, essentially, since any manipulation beyond the peak anyway does not matter, it's really a question of, you know, can you change your peak to something else? And the way the mechanism is set up, uh, you just cannot. So, so even if the rest of your ranking is something uh, fancy and potentially not single peaked, it will still not help. Okay. So, is this clear that that nobody has an incentive to manipulate with respect to the median candidate? Yeah. So, I would say this is yeah. So, this is again trying to say that there's nothing interesting to be done here. Okay, so, um, so one thing that I am actively omitting in the context of single peak preferences is the issue of um, identifying them. So this is actually an interesting um, um, uh, algorithm and, and it's actually pretty old as well. Uh, it involves setting up a matrix based on, based on the rankings and checking if the matrix has the so-called consecutive ones property. So it's a binary matrix, all the entries are zero or one, and a matrix has the consecutive ones property if in every row all the ones appear contiguously. There is, there is no break, so it's a run of zeros followed by a run of ones followed by a run of zeros, where the run of zeros, one of them may even be empty. So that, that is something that turns out to be, so, so we know how to check if matrices have this property. So this, the way this works is by reducing this to the consecutive ones problem. Um, but I won't, um, I won't really be saying anything more about this. Uh, maybe what I will do is give you the construction of the matrix. Um, uh, again. Uh, probably a tutorial problem is the best place to do this. I will give you how the matrix is constructed from the permutations and it's a nice exercise to figure out what consecutive ones has to do with single peakness. So, uh, 
So again, that is something that I'm slightly deferring. In the interest of spending whatever time I have to tell you a little bit about multi-winner voting rules, this is something that I promise that I'll allude to. And um, we'll also see uh, we'll also see how uh, domain restrictions can be interesting or useful in the context of coming up with efficient winner determination algorithms for voting rules which are kind of difficult to wrestle with in terms of even coming up with the winner. So let me just spend a couple of minutes drawing your attention to the fact that all the voting rules that we have discussed so far, I haven't really explicitly talked about algorithms for computing the winner with respect to these voting rules, mostly because the algorithms were straightforward from the definitions. So if you looked at board account or scoring rules or co-plan, figuring out who has the highest co-plan score or figuring out who has the best BODA score, all of these things can be, you can write little programs to compute these winners by pretty much following the definitions and there isn't uh, 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 any, uh, any challenges that you would run into. Uh, but from a certain point of view, winner determination is the most fundamental question you need to ask about a voting rule. When you come up with a voting rule, you want to know, well, uh, is this voting rule efficiently computable? Can we, um, uh, can we actually work out who the winner is with respect to this voting rule quickly? And as I said, we haven't really encountered voting rules where the answer to this question would be tricky. So, so we have kind of bypassed it altogether. Uh, however, there are voting rules which are very interesting but which are a little tricky to deal with or you could say that they are unpopular in practice because it turns out that we don't know how to efficiently compute the winners with respect to some of these rules. So for instance, one voting rule of the cuff which has this sort of a, a situation is the Dodson voting rule which basically is a voting rule that's in love with Condorcet winners. So the rule says if there is a Condorcet winner, then output it. But as we know, we may not always have a Condorcet winner. So the rule says what is the smallest number of changes that you need to make to the profile to make a particular candidate a Condorcet winner. Okay? So suppose you have a candidate C. The Dodson score of a candidate C is the smallest number of swaps that you need to make in the voters' votes to push C up to Condorcet winner status. So if you change the votes, of course, there is some possibility of eliminating majority cycles. And in particular, if you change the votes drastically enough, you will be able to get to the point of a Condorcet winner. But the question is, what is the smallest number of changes that you need to make to make a particular candidate see a Condorcet winner? That is the Dodson score of that candidate. So essentially, you are asking, is a candidate really close to being Condorcet, meaning that maybe there are some uh, silly voters whom you can, you know, adjust, whose votes you can adjust a little bit and then make see a Condorcet winner. So that's, that's an idea that Dodson tries to capture. But I'd encourage you to think about how you would com compute the Dodson score of a particular candidate. It's not obvious. Uh, you know, computing the Boda score of a candidate or computing the Copeland score of a candidate, it was fairly easy from the definition. But from this definition, I'm not sure that it's obvious how to compute the Dodson score. Of course, you could try all possible ways of doing all possible swaps uh, to the voter profile and seeing how it affects C's Condorcet status and then go for the set of swaps which is the smallest in number. But this is a terribly inefficient approach and uh, you know, uh, maybe just come up with like, you know, the complexity of this brute force approach, you will find that it is, um, it is, it's really bad. So uh, it's certainly exponential, probably even double exponential. So yeah, um, so that's, that's a fairly inefficient way of doing things. So can you come up with something that is better? So, uh, so that's a question that again, I want to just uh, leave you with. I'm not going to dig deeper into Dodson uh, now. Uh, 
but I want to tell you about another voting rule which also feels very appealing but has the issue that it's not easy or it's not obvious how you can compute the winners and I want to do an example in the committee setting because that's a setting that uh, we haven't touched upon yet. And uh, one of the reasons for bringing this, is, uh, bringing this up is that uh, we'll be able to also observe that if your profile happened to be single peaked, then actually there is a nice way of computing the winners efficiently. So that's another advantage of looking at restricted domains. It, I mean, not just resistance to manipulation, but some really nice voting rules which were out of reach just because they were hard to compute. Winner determination was tricky. Uh, they become more accessible because the, the structure of single peaked profiles uh, lets you uh, come up with interesting algorithms. So that's going to be the rest of the story here. Okay, so uh, recall that the multi-winner setting is where, again, we have a collection of rankings, let's say, and we want to output a committee of size k, of fixed size, okay, and in these slides, uh, again, the notation is that every row is a ranking and the icons depict alternatives. Maybe, again, this is you folks trying to figure out how you want to spend the evening. So go out for dinner, go out for coffee, go out for a concert or uh, you know, watch a football match. It should have been cricket, but anyway, okay, so we'll live with this. But, okay, so these are, uh, uh, these are a bunch of rankings and what we want to do is uh, in the multi-winner setting, we want to we want to select. Let's say in this case, we want to select two options. We want to narrow it down to two options. Um, so here is a particular uh, here's a particular approach which says that uh, basically I'm going to see. Okay. Uh, so I'm going to. I'm going to ask myself how far do I need to go for, for every voter, um, how far do I need to go before I appease the voter, I mean the voter says that TK now at least one of these options is something that I'm okay with. So for instance, if I pick the options of having coffee and going to a concert, the last four voters have these options at their top spot, so we are going to say that these voters are fully satisfied with this outcome because there's at least one person in the in the committee that that you have suggested or there's one alternative in the committee that turns out to be their favorite alternative so they are not going to complain the people who are going to complain are the first two voters for whom what has happened is that you need to go up to their second spot to be able to see at least somebody in the committee whom they uh, you know, whom they like. So up to, okay, so, so in the top position, uh, the first two voters are like, we don't, we don't see anybody that we like in the committee, okay. And so these voters are going to be, let's just label these as unhappy voters. But if I draw a line at the second column, then I see that at this point, everybody has somebody that they like in the committee, okay. So that's my, so, so you can think of this as putting up a dissatisfaction threshold, okay? So um, how far do I need to go before I can be sure that for every voter there is an alternative before the line that I've drawn uh, that actually exists in the committee, okay? So that line is certainly not here, but you know, I can, I can just about manage here, okay? So again, if you want to be a little more precise about this, you can define the dissatisfaction of a voter with respect to a committee as the rank of, so the voter looks at the committee and figures out who is her favorite candidate in the committee, right, among all the options. So I have a ranking, so I figure out who is my favorite candidate in the committee, right? So let's just say, let's just say that the highlighted candidates in the bottom row are my choice of committee. So I go to a voter and I ask her, well, you know, who is your favorite candidate in this committee? So in this case, so let's say that the orange candidate is the voter's favorite candidate, right? The blue candidate is ranked last, let's say. 
and so her top two candidates didn't even make it to the committee and the orange candidate is her best bet among the people who have been chosen in the committee. She likes the orange one the best. Okay, so the dissatisfaction of this voter, so again you could, what is typically defined as the border dissatisfaction. So the, if your favorite candidate got picked, your border dissatisfaction is zero because it would be quite nitpicky of you to say that you have a dissatisfaction if your favorite person is in the committee. So the dissatisfaction is zero if your top candidate is in the committee. But if your top candidate is missing and your second candidate, your second favorite candidate is present in the committee, then you have a dissatisfaction of one and so on and so forth. So it's zero, one, two, three and so on. So in this case, this particular voter that's highlighted has a dissatisfaction of two because it's the third, I mean, her third ranked candidate is her best bet in the committee, okay? So there are two versions of, uh, or there are two ways in which you can evaluate a proposed committee. Either you could look at, you could write down all the dissatisfaction scores and you could, I mean, are there, what do you want to do with these dissatisfaction scores? So you could add them up and you could say that you want to minimize the sum of all the dissatisfaction scores or you could also take the worst dissatisfaction score and you say that you want to minimize the maximum dissatisfaction. Okay. Yeah. So the size of the committee is fixed, that is correct. How can we make sure that the sum is, uh, so we just, so, yeah, so that point can be as bad as M minus K, where M is the total number of candidates. So if nothing else, you will see them at the end, right? So, but if you have such a committee for whom, so let's say you're trying to pick a committee of size two, and there is a voter, for whom the two people that you have picked are their bottom ranked and the you know second last choices, then they would be pretty unhappy about such a committee. So they will really drive up both the maximum dissatisfaction score as well as the sum. So um, that and that is our mechanism for evaluating the strength of a committee really. So if there is, in fact, you could also. Uh, you know, rephrase that as a criticism for the maximum dissatisfaction proposal because you could have a committee where out of 100 voters, 99 voters are pretty happy with the choices that you have made. So maybe everyone has one of the two candidates of the committee in their top three positions, let's say. And if, assuming, there are 10 candidates, there could be one voter for whom both the candidates that you have chosen are ranked 9th and 10th, okay? In this case, the maximum dissatisfaction score will be the worst possible, which is 8, because you, you know, her favorite candidate is ranked 9th, so the dissatisfaction score would be 8, which is the worst that it can be, but there's only one voter who is that unhappy, right? Everyone else is pretty all right with the choices that you have made. So you could argue that this is not the best way to evaluate a committee because you should perhaps account for also the number of voters and how unhappy they are, which kind of motivates the definition with respect to the sum where you are accounting for everyone separately. Uh, you could also presumably look at the average dissatisfaction that that could be another metric, although I, I think because that's linearly related to the sum people just look at uh, I mean, it's, it's proportionally related to the sum, so that's, that's why people just work with the sum instead. Um, but yeah, between maximum and sum, this, this, is, um, uh, this, this would be one point of difference. Uh, there are versions of such voting rules where you try to account for outliers and you try to ask yourself, well, if you dropped a few extreme candidates, uh, sorry, a few fringe voters who perhaps think very differently from the bulk of the population that you're working with, 
then maybe you know maybe the score improves drastically but uh, we'll really not be talking about outliers so much right now but it's something that's been explored in the literature but okay so this is the um, so this is the Chamberlain current this is called the Chamberlain current score of a committee uh, it's the um, Again, there are two versions. You could either take the maximum dissatisfaction or the or the sum. So this is called, I think the, the maximum is called the L infinity CC score and the sum is called the L1 CC score. So both versions um, are interesting to look at or are interesting to study. Um, okay, I mean, I just wanted to quickly check how many of you are familiar with NB hardness. I have done NP hardness in your coursework. Okay, that's that's a few of you. Okay, uh, for those of you who are familiar with the concept, uh, it turns out that computing an optimal CC committee in either regime um, is uh, is in fact NP hard which in plain language is to say that it's very unlikely that there exists an efficient mechanism to compute the optimal CC committee, which is to say the committee, an algorithm that outputs the committee with the smallest either L1 or L infinity dissatisfaction score, yeah. Uh, on the other hand, um, if you were working with single peaked preferences, then you can actually come up uh, with a way to discover a nice CC committee and let me see if I can. Um, Oops, sorry. Okay. Yeah, I think this is the correct set of slides. So, uh, so I think here what I want to do is identify the peaks. Uh, so these are the voters, okay, and. Um, the red, the, the highlighted candidates are the favorite candidates of these voters, okay? And the candidates have been ordered according to the harmonious ordering, right? And let's say that we are interested in, um, let's say we are interested in finding a committee which, uh, so, so again, I'm thinking of which version would be the simplest to deal with. Let's just say that we are trying to minimize the maximum dissatisfaction score here, okay? Uh, so in this, okay, so in particular, let me even say that I am looking for a committee which has a dissatisfaction of at most D because that will make it easier for me to uh, describe the approach, you can just run your algorithm through all values of D, right? So if you want to find the smallest dissatisfaction, just try and see if there is a committee with a dissatisfaction of D is equal to 0, D is equal to 1, D is equal to 2, and so on. And the first place where your algorithm says, well, I have found a committee whose dissatisfaction is just this D, the first point where the algorithm returns yes, that is the optimal dissatisfaction. Right? Okay, so so let's look at the first voter, right? And let's say that we are um, uh, let's say that we are trying to work with a dissatisfaction of d is equal to one. So for every voter, I want to make sure that I have somebody who is either their top position, which is their peak, or the position just prior to the peak, right? So either side, right? So, so the first voter has the peak at E, and let's say the next candidate is F, okay? It's either this or it is this. Remember that with single peaked it cannot be anything else. Your second position must be either immediately to the left of the peak or immediately to the right of the peak. You don't really have a choice. So let's say that this is what the vote looks like. 
okay um in fact let's just make it maybe a little more interesting and say that i'm looking for a dissatisfaction a target dissatisfaction of b is equal to 2 so in fact i can even afford to choose a committee which picks the third the third ranked candidate for for the voters right so again the third ranked candidate so so for the first voter the second position was either f or d and i said okay maybe it's f what is the next what's the third ranked candidate what are my options where can the third ranked candidate be it's either g or or d so it's either this or this yeah so again maybe let's just say that it it was d for the second voter again i want to identify you know who are the people that my committee is allowed to pick if it must manage with a dissatisfaction of 2 so again i go to the voter and i ask her well i know that your top preference is b who is your second preference and again i know that the response will be either c or a so let's say she responds with a then her next favorite candidate in fact has to be has to be c right and i perhaps repeat this exercise for the third voter and uh, her second favorite candidate is either c or e so let's say it is c and her third favorite candidate is either b or b or e right in this example so let's again say that it is b and similarly maybe this is e or f yeah so essentially these are i mean i really have to make sure that the committee that i pick picks at least one of the highlighted one of the highlighted candidates in each row is that clear right so i haven't told you what the size of the committee is yet but we can we can fix anything you like so maybe let's say that Okay, so in fact, let's experiment. Is equal to one. So, is there a committee of size one which has a dissatisfaction of two, just by inspection? Notice that I have to make sure that I pick up at least one highlighted, uh, one highlighted candidate from each row. so is it possible for me to do is there any candidate that that actually has this property that they that they meet uh you know that they are within the top 3 for every voter not really right i mean you know you could actually try um uh, if you are not convinced so if i try a that's not going to work uh the most promising seems to be d but i mean the most promising from a greedy point of view greedy uh, i mean d satisfies 3 of the 4 voters but misses out on one but d combined with c seems to account for everyone right so we do have a committee of size 2 with a dissatisfaction of 2 but we have no committee of size 1 with a dissatisfaction of 2 but if we are willing to maybe increase the dissatisfaction a bit by one more then d would work if uh, we are living willing to live with the dissatisfaction of 3 then d would work right so how can we turn this into a general sort of an algorithm um so what did we observe we observed that we need to basically figure out where the top d plus 1 candidates lie for each voter right so i can i can pick any of the top d plus 1 candidates and be within the dissatisfaction bound yeah so where do the top d plus 1 candidates lie well they lie close to the peak and in particular they form an interval around the peak right yeah they form an interval around the peak that's that's something that we observed in a ad hoc sort of fashion but it's hopefully clear because the top candidate is the peak the next candidate is on either side of the peak so you maintain a continuity there the third candidate will have to either continue 
going downhill in the direction you've already started on or it picks up from the left from the other side of the peak but as you go along you essentially build this interval around the peak which you know so so it's either this or this or this but it's it's one of these one of these intervals depending on how the voter chose to interleave the candidates around the peak right but essentially the top d plus one candidates for every voter is an interval on this line an interval of length d and in finding a committee which has the desired dissatisfaction what are you trying to do um, Yeah, so you're trying to essentially intercept all of these intervals. So you're trying to find a subset of K candidates, which are such that if you dropped vertical lines from them in this picture, they will end up, every interval will get stabbed by one of these lines, right? That's what you want, right? Because if every interval gets stabbed, that means that, so each interval corresponds to a voter and an interval getting stabbed by a candidate corresponds to the fact that that chosen candidate manage to fit within the top D plus one choices for that particular voter, right? So if you have a collection of intervals on a line, uh, in this case, they are even intervals of the same length. Uh, in general, they don't even have to be of the same length. But if you have a collection of intervals over a line and you're looking for K vertical lines that stab all the intervals, how would you check if it is possible to find k lines that stab all the intervals? So in this case, it was fairly straightforward by inspection, but in general, can you imagine a strategy for stabbing a collection of intervals with a fixed number of lines? So let me just go through. So here again, we are looking at a dissatisfaction of three. So in this case, in fact, there is a committee of size one even. But can you think of a greedy strategy for stabbing a set of intervals? So can you, for example, sweep the candidates from left to right and only decide to pick a candidate when the situation is really desperate? Can you formalize this idea? Right, so, um, so basically you could perhaps look at the interval which ends the earliest, right? And you know that you have to pick at the very least, you have to pick the candidate where this interval stops, right? And, and it's all right to not pick any candidate before this because this was the interval that stopped first. So you're not missing out on anybody by not picking a candidate before the place where this interval finishes. So look at the interval which finishes the earliest, right? Uh, because, no, so, I mean, for the sake of contradiction, let's say that by only picking this candidate and not picking anyone before it, let's say there was somebody who got left out, didn't get stabbed. But if you didn't get stabbed, that means that you started and finished even before, uh, you know, our stabbing point came in. But that contradicts the choice of the, uh, that contradicts the greedy choice of the interval that we said finishes first because then the black interval finishes even before the greedy choice, right? That's the only way that it can be left out, right? So you greedily pick the interval, the last candidate on the interval that finishes first and that will probably automatically knock out a bunch of other intervals, which is great. You can push them out of the picture because they are done and dusted. And then you sort of repeat the strategy and every, at every point you have picked a candidate that was in some sense necessary and sufficient for your solution, right? Okay, so that again can be made precise, but, uh, but you can argue that if with this strategy you manage to pick up K candidates that hit all the intervals, then great. 
otherwise it is in fact not possible because you were being very stingy about when you picked the candidate so if you didn't manage with k then uh, you know it's it is in fact not possible to find k candidates that that hit all the intervals okay so um, so that is a strategy that works to find uh, you know a committee that has the smallest value for the maximum dissatisfaction as i said it's simplest to just fix a dissatisfaction target and work with that if you want to find the optimal you just try all possible values of the dissatisfaction and uh, you know run through them you could even binary search the range of possible dissatisfaction scores to find the optimal uh, what is a little more non trivial is finding uh, an optimal CC committee on single crossing profiles. Um, I'll not actually get into the algorithm, but I'll at least define this class for you because it shares many of the nice properties of single peaked profiles. Uh, it's, uh, it's, it's sort of in contrast with single peaked profiles because here we are looking at an ordering on the voters rather than an ordering on the candidates. and what we are saying is that a profile is single crossing if there is a way of lining up the voters in a way that ensures that for every pair of candidates there is a clean point where the opinion of the voters switch okay so up to a point you have all the voters preferring a over b and beyond that point you have all the voters preferring b over a Okay, so there's one clean switching point uh, which may not even come. So it's possible that there are a pair of candidates for which the the entire vote is unanimous, which is uh, which is permitted, and that's fine. But if there is a switch, there is only one place where we switch. Okay, so so if it is possible to order the voters in such a way that for every pair of candidates there is one voter i such that all voters up to i prefer a over b and all voters beyond i prefer b over a then the profile is called single crossing and the name is again uh, intuitive uh, relative to what is going on here and what i want you to think about is uh, again it's a nice exercise that if you're given a profile which is single crossing, then in fact any Chamberlain current committee is actually fairly organized. If you go to the voters, line them up in the single crossing order, right? And let me just say that you have a committee that you are analyzing, okay, whose Chamberlain current behavior you are analyzing. Um, it cannot be that. For example, these three voters here say that green was my favorite candidate and then a voter says that yellow is my favorite candidate and then the next voter says that green is my favorite candidate. Okay, this sort of thing will not happen. And why is that? Based on the fact that this is a single crossing order. So remember for single crossing, we said that for every pair of candidates, it is true that there is only one place where there is a switch. So up to a point, all voters are like green over yellow and beyond that point, all voters are like yellow over green, right? So here, can you see a violation of the single crossing sort of structure? So you probably see it here. This voter says yellow is less preferred over green. That's why he declares green to be his favorite candidate. This one prefers yellow over green because she has said yellow is my favorite candidate. And this clearly prefers green over yellow because, because he has said that green is my favorite candidate. Okay, so you have these three, these three orders, but these three relative preferences between green and yellow. But that means that you have two places where you switched, right? So from yellow over green to green over yellow to yellow over green. But that violates the, the whole notion of single crossingness. So if you have a single crossing profile, then you'll see that if you enlist the favorite candidates uh, of voters in any committee, these favorites will come in chunks, okay? So there's a whole interval of voters who are going to say that, okay, this chap is my favorite and so on. So what, 
is interesting is that you can take advantage of this property to design a very nice dynamic programming algorithm to actually discover the best CC committee. So um, since I'm running out of time, I'll probably not get into the actual algorithm, but if you like algorithmic puzzles, then see how you can take advantage of this property to design an algorithm for single crossing profiles. Okay? And single crossing profiles, again, you could ask the same questions that you asked for single peak, meaning can you identify them quickly? Uh, do they have the other nice properties? There are reasons why single crossing profiles are also considered to be a natural model for preferences, uh, but that's something that uh, has more to do with, again, economics and political theory, so I will not be going there at all. But this is just to give you a sense of the fact that you can carve out interesting, uh, you know, uh, subdomains from, you know, very general profiles and uh, you can derive interesting results for, uh, you know, for these notions of restricted domain. So we have seen just a couple. There are many, many more which are, which are, uh, you know, very well studied and very interesting. And one that I didn't talk about is Euclidean domains. So where you have candidates and voters sitting in some Euclidean space and the preferences are basically based on distance. So it's, uh, I mean, if your Euclidean space is just 1D, it's just the real line, then this is actually a subclass of single peak preferences and you can convince yourself about that. Uh, in fact, this is another thing that people also do. They compare different restrictions emerging from different ideas and see how the domains even overlap or relate with each other. So it really is a very rich sort of theory and there, there have been a couple of very recent surveys about restricted domains which are both very comprehensive and accessible. So uh, if you find this interesting, then again, uh, those two surveys would be nice places to start. And we will, um, again, it'll be there in the references on the website. So, so if you have a chance, please look it up.